Okay. Okay, so we are learning the mimer, the atatetzave, a very, very important mimer. As we said, it's the last mimer that the Rebbe gave us uh, before Gimel Tamos. And it's a very powerful mimer with a very important lesson, right? So, you know, just to, you know, give you a quick summary of what we've spoken so far, right? We were talking about uh, the Pasuk, Atatetzave, and you command to the Jewish people. We had a bunch of questions on that Pasuk, right? Why does it say Moshe command? Why does it say, um, you know, La Maur, which is the luminary? It says, you know, just to tell you again what the Pasuk said, because, you know, we keep going back to this Pasuk, that's important to, re, you know, to remind, to refresh what the Pasuk says. It says, Atatetzave is many Israel, and you, Moshe, right? And you command uh, Jewish people, Ve'ku Alech Hashem and Zayizach Katis La Maur, and they should bring to you uh, pure olive oil, pr- pure crushed olive oil um, for the luminary, the, the, the right? To, to uh, light a, uh, an eternal light. And we had a bunch of questions. Why luminary? Uh, why are they bringing the, 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 the oil to Moshe? What, what, you know, what's this eternal light? If the, if the menorah was only lit at nights. Uh, and we had a bunch of questions like that, right? So we started explaining uh, that this idea of bringing the oil to Moshe is the idea that, you know, when Moshe connects, right? Moshe brings out the connection, the essential connection that the Jewish people have with God. He himself gets an elevation that's represented by this oil. The oil represents the essence that the Jewish people bring back to Moshe. Moshe becomes elevated himself. And then we started talking about this concept that Moshe, the Moshe of each generation, is called the Raya Me'emna. Okay, we translated that in two possible ways. Number one, a faithful shepherd, right? He's a shepherd and he's very faithful. Another way is a shepherd of faith, right? In other ways that, that he takes the Jewish people and he feeds them and he nourishes them with their faith, right? He helps them internalize the faith, right? Um, and we spoke a little bit about... Um, we spoke a little bit about, you know, why do you need to internalize the faith, right? We said that a, Jew, a person, a Jewish person is a mamin, b'nei mamin, is a uh, believer, the son of believer, which means that just by virtue of being of being Jewish, you are, uh, you have faith in God. It's not something you can do anything about, whether you like it or not, you have faith in God. You could hide it, you could pretend all day and all night, but in the end, deep, deep, deep inside, you're connected to God in a very, very strong way, and therefore you have faith in God. Right? The problem is that that faith can be what we call the mock, right? Um, uh, let's call it external or surrounding, right? It's not internalized. And, you know, when we said that when a person has such a type of uh, faith, right, you could be like a thief, right? We gave the example of a thief that Gemara brings, a thief that prays to God to succeed in his theft. That doesn't make sense, right? If you believe in God, why do you steal? If you, right? We, we ask that question. If you, if, you, if you don't believe in God, why do you, who are you praying to? So we explained that, you know, what happens is when you have this faith, but it's not internalized, right? You believe in God, you know, there's a God, but you don't internalize what that means. What, how does that translate into my day-to-day life? And what Moshe helps you do is to internalize that to, to, in, in a way that it's going to affect your life and you can experience it. But even more so that you're going to experience that connection so strongly that you're able, you realize that you're, you, that you're, you're happy to give your life for that connection, right? Messias Nefesh, give your over your life, Okay. Uh, and, you know, we, we also explained, right, um, that, you know, th- we see that specifically when, when, when in Purim, right, because in Purim we said, Kimu Mashikibu, the Jewish people uh, finally, like, basically finished receiving the Torah in, in Purim, right, many thousands of years later after um, the giving of the Torah. So it was when you finished getting the Torah. And the answer was yes, because when we start in Matan Torah, Hashem gave us the Torah, but we didn't necessarily receive it. We didn't necessarily you know, bond with it. Only in Purim was when the Jewish people as a nation for the first time ever decided, you know, we are willing to die for this. And when you say I'm willing to die for this, you're saying this is a part of who I am. This is a part of me. And that is true receiving of the Torah. It's when you realize that it's not just something you have. It's like an addition to your life. It's an accessory, right? It's part of who you are. It is who you are. It's your connection. And that, right, that is essential to that receiving of the Torah. And that happened in Purim. Right, and we learned that in order to be able to do that, the Jewish people had to go and have that mysterious nefesh, had to risk their lives, go out and study Torah by, uh, under the leadership of Mordechai, right, and risk their life for the Torah, uh, and, and, and in order to accomplish this, right. 
so that is where we uh, are up to. Okay. Um, okay. Now we're going to go and start diving a little bit deeper into this idea of how faith, how emuna works in the Jewish soul. And this is really, a, you know, where it starts getting the most interesting, in my opinion. This is like this. Okay. So we've established already that we, the Jewish people, are called believers, the sons of believers, right? Meaning we believe by virtue of being Jewish. But why? Why is it, right, that our soul is compelled to believe in God? Why is it that you can go on for 70 or 80 years, right, calling yourself an atheist and saying you don't believe in God, and then push comes to shove at the end, you know, at the end of the day, you know, something happens, a Nazi comes, whatever it is, God forbid, and a person says, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew, and I'm going to die a Jew. Why? Where is that coming from? Where? Clearly not an intellectual thing. It's not something that you arrived at by thinking, by, you know, because that's, you know, throughout the time, you would have argued and debated everything against God. So why, you know, why is it that we have this as such a deep part of us? And it comes out that we actually have two reasons, two different levels, okay, from which this faith comes from, okay? Two different levels, okay? And, and, and it, where, which level is expressing itself is going to have a, 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 an effect in the actual type of faith, the way the faith is actually going to be revealed, okay? Level number one. Okay, we have, as we mentioned in a previous mimer, we have a, a few different levels of our soul. Okay, we most of which are internal, right? We have our uh, sort of like a, our animalistic part of our soul, that not the animal soul, but like the just the uh, enlivening part of our soul, just the part that makes us alive, right? That you know, alive like a plant is alive, right? Then you have a part of well, perhaps that's not the best example, but like uh, just alive, exist. Okay, then you have a part of your soul that makes you feel, grow, emotions, right? That's, you know, that's something already more, you know. Then you have a part of your soul that is intellectual, right? That, that sustain, makes us distinguishable from animals and other beings, right? We're intellectual. We actually can understand things in ways that are abstract. But then we have a few, two, diff, two other levels of our soul, which are above us, right? They are, as we say, makif, surrounding us. They're not you know, internalized in the body. They're not in one part of the body or in a, in a specific area. They're kind of uh, subliminal. They're more um, ethereal, okay? And what happens is uh, there's a story, okay? There's a story of, uh, you know, in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, that it says that uh, Daniel was having a prophecy and a bunch of people were there. And all of a sudden they got struck with fear, right? As Daniel was having a prophecy, these people started getting this fear, irrational fear they couldn't explain. And the Gemara asked the question, these people, they didn't see anything. They didn't see anything scary. They were just standing there. And all of a sudden, they felt afraid. Where is that fear coming from? And the answer they, that they say is, okay, those are the words, mazalayu chazi, which means like this. Even though that they don't see what was going on, right? Again, Daniel was there. The godly presence is coming over him. Is you know something big is happening, but you don't you don't see anything. Anybody coming into that room would see a person, you know, perhaps laying on a bed, sitting on a floor. I don't know, nothing, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. But even though that they don't see, this is what the Gemara says. Even though they don't see what was going on, mazalayu, their souls, this part of their soul that transcends transcends the body, that can you know experience spirituality, lives in a spiritual realm, that part of your soul does see. Okay, so what happened was when these people walked into this room, this part of your soul that we spoke about that's, uh, you know, kind of outside of your body, saw that the Neo was having a prophecy, saw that the godly presence was there. And that trickled down to their, uh, to their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The conscious being selves, right? Their con and, and, and they started to feel fear, but they didn't know why. Okay, so what happens is here with our faith is the same thing. Why do we have faith? Well, very simple. Step number, level number one, okay, more, more basic one, right? You have a part of your soul that lives and experiences the spiritual realm constantly, spirituality, right? It's not limited by physical eyes and physical brain, and it doesn't see things in a physical way. So it sees godliness, and for it, it is obvious. 
seeing in the spiritual realm, the, the realm of spirituality, seeing godliness, it's an obvious thing. You stand there, you see, obviously God exists. In this physical world, the physical world is designed to conceal godliness, to conceal, you know, the truth of things, right? So, so we can strive to, you know, to, to believe in a world that's, you know, not obvious. It's a, it's a challenge. We want the challenge. But in a spiritual realm when, where, where, this, where this part of our soul is, you see godliness and godliness is 100% obvious. Of course God exists. There's no argument against it. It's not, it's like a silly thing. Of course it exists. It's there. And because of that, that trickles down and, there, and it affects us also that we also believe. We don't know why. It's not an intellectual thing because we read it in a book or we saw something or, or it's not an emotional thing. It's just something that our soul sees and it affects how we feel because it's part of our soul. Okay, that's step number one. We call it mazala yuchaz. His the, the the soul sees, the soul experiences God, and therefore believes in Him. Okay, and that's why we as Jews we have we have a, a believing God. Okay, because our soul experiences God. Okay, uh, I'm not even 100 percent sure that this this level is actually specifically unique to Jews. I'm not sure. It might be. Maybe I'm I'm speaking. It might it might, but it might not be. I'm not sure. But the idea that a soul sees. You know, godliness, and, and, and because of that, you know, the person believes in God, even though they don't know why. Okay, that's level number one. Okay, level number two is much deeper, and this definitely is only is unique to Jews. Okay, level number two is much, much deeper, and that is like this. Okay, so the first level was an experiential, so, you know, yes, experiential on the level of the soul, not consciously experiential, but experiential nonetheless. It was an experiential thing, right? You see something, you believe it exists, right? You're sitting there, you see a table, there's a table, I believe there's a table. Why do you believe there's a table? Because they see it, I touch it, I feel it, I smell it, it's a table, right? Level number two is an essential, is an essential existential um, reason why we believe in God. We believe in God because in our essence, the deepest level of our soul, right? The previous level that we spoke about is a spiritual level. It's very high. It's very lofty, not limited by the body, but it's not our essence. But then if you dig deeper, you look into our essence, at the essence of our soul, that soul is one with God. Is one with God. So how, why do we believe in God? The faith that comes from this level is not something that we see, we believe because we see. It's we believe because we are. We believe because it's, it's, it's who we are, right? Do you believe, like, as I said, you believe a table exists because you feel it, you touch it, you see it, right? Now, let me ask you, do you believe you exist? Yeah, why? Is it because you see yourself in a mirror? Do you believe you exist because you, you, you touch yourself, right? You, you, can, you can feel your hands, you can feel your body. Like, is that what it is? No, you believe you exist because, because you are. Here I am, it's me, right? I'm not sure if this is a perfect example, but this is how I see it. Right, I don't believe that I exist because I see myself. I believe I exist because it is who I am. It cannot be any other way. So when it comes down to uh, believing in God, it's the same thing. At the essence of our soul, our soul and the level of Yechida that we've discussed before is Yechida because it's one. Yechid means to one, oneness, unity, is one with God. So from that level, of course, there's no room for not believing in God, but not because it's obvious, because you see the, the spiritual existence of God as something external, but rather because it is who you are. It is one with you. And therefore, of course, it exists. It is who I am. It's my essence. Okay? And that's where this, this, the, the deepest part of the faith in God that the Jewish person has comes from. Okay, so there's these two levels, one deeper than the next. Okay. Um, and now the beauty of it is, right, when, when we're talking about the faith that comes from the first level, right, the, first, the level of the, of the soul experiencing uh, divinity, seeing divinity, right, then that generates a, a, a faith that is, as we said, makif, surrounding, external, right? Why? Because this is a part of our soul that, as we said, is makif. It's not something internal. It's not something that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not something, you know, that's part of our conscience, right? It's, it's subconscious, right? And because of that, it sees, it experiences, and it affects us. But its effect is also on us, market. It's surrounding. It's not internal. It's not something that I experience in my body, right? 
I experience the effects of it, but I don't necessarily feel it in the way that it's as internalized. However, when we talk about faith that comes from the essence of the soul, right? The essence of the soul in its highest level is the essence of the soul in the market level, and it's the essence of the soul in the, in the most internal level in our bodies. It's the same essence, right? The essence is the same through and through. It doesn't change, right? Your DNA is the same in your brain than in your toe. It's the same. It's the same. It's who you are, right? It doesn't change. Your brain might be the loftiest part of your body. Thinking about the, the deepest things, the deepest concepts and secrets in Theta, right? And your toe is just a toe, right? Toenail. Nevertheless, DNA doesn't change because it's the essence of our physical body. And that's the same through and through, right? So and spiritually, it's the same thing. So when you have that essence of your soul is one with God, and that essence of your soul is also the essence of your body, of your physical, of, of, of your, of your, the lowest part of your soul, right? So therefore, it affects you in an internal way. That faith that comes out through, you know, from the essence of the soul affects you in the most internal way possible. Okay, and now we can understand that this, that what the Raya Me'amna does, what the Moshe of each generation tries to do, is to bring out the essence of our soul, that faith. When we say that he's helping us internalize faith, right? He's feeding us with faith and nourishing us with faith. He's talking about the faith that comes from the essence of our soul, so that we're able to, to give, to have Messias Nefesh, to give our life over. Why? Because of that same reason, right? It is who we are right? This faith comes from the essence of me, and that essence of me is one with God. And therefore, what do you mean? I'm not even giving my life for God. It, this is my life. If that means somebody's going to have to shoot me, that, okay, but, but, but this is my life. I can't separate myself from God because I'm one with God, okay? Um, okay, and now based on this, we can explain something very interesting, okay? We see that Moshe Rabbeinu, right, the, the Moses of each generation, they have the, 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 the job of, you know, uh, giving us uh, understanding, right, Make, helping, uh, helping us understand, right, but, and, and also, as we said, the, the job of help, helping us internalize uh, our faith to the extent that, you know, we're able to go on a mysterious nefesh, right, and even risk our lives and appreciate who we are in the face of all adversity. And in this sense, you could say that the Moshe Rabbeinu of the time of Purim, okay, Mordechai, um, actually did, you know, you can, his job in, the, in this regard of bringing, you know, bringing faith in an internal way to the Jewish people is, is even, he did so in a much more revealed way than with Moses, right? Moses, Moshe, right? His generation was called, was called the generation of knowledge. He did his job of imparting knowledge to the Jewish people in a way that was brilliant, right? He did everything, right? He, did, he was a full, you know, he was Moshe Rabbeinu. He did everything that Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to do. But this part of him, of imparting knowledge, internalizing knowledge, right, shone out the most brightly. But he wasn't facing the adversity that people in the time of Mordecai and in the time that we live today are facing. And that is, right, the adversity of Galos, of exile where we need to live with Messias Nefesh, right? And I say we also, even though we live in the United States, right? Or in Israel, in, in, you know, in the modern world, where we don't feel we're being threatened, our lives are not being threatened. And I'm going to show you later why I say we need to live with Messias Nefesh, right? Because that's one of the lessons that we're going to get at this final, right? How's Messias Nefesh applied to us? We're in a comfortable place. Nobody's holding a gun to my head, thank God. So how does Messias Nefesh apply to us? So, so I say we on purpose. We're going to get to why. Okay, not, not necessarily today, but we're going to get to what? But what I'm saying is, how do we live with Messias Nefesh? Uh, you know, we need to live with Messias Nefesh. Mordecai needed to live with Messias Nefesh, the Jewish people. In the time of Mordecai, what Mordecai did was help them internalize that faith so they could come out with Messias Nefesh, right? Even in the time when they were, when they were going to, that meant risking their lives. Okay, and that you can see it more in Mordecai than you can see it even with, uh, with, Mor with, with Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, okay. And that's what we say. The Midrash says that Mordechai was as big and as important in his generation like Moshe was in his generation. Okay.
Okay. And then we finalize this, this, this section, right, of, of the mimer saying, right, that the fact that the Friedike Rebbe, okay, because remember, we were bringing, up, we keep bringing up a mimer of the Friedike Rebbe, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe. The fact that the Friedike Rebbe brought this idea, right, that the, the Mordechai in his generation was like Moshe in his generation. Because he helped the Jewish people live with Messias Nefesh and go all out, no matter the adversity, right? Hints, okay, at the fact that the Friedrich Rebbe was doing the same thing. In the time of the Friedrich Rebbe, he lived in Russia, right? And we know the sort of adversity that the Jewish Russians needed to deal with and how they lived in a time where they weren't allowed to be Jewish. And nevertheless, the Friedrich Rebbe came out like a lion and encouraged them and pushed them to say, we need to live like Jews because this is who we are. And people died and people gave their lives for Judaism. And people gave their lives to build yeshivas and mikvahs and schools, right? All for the sake that Jewish people should be able to live like Jews, right? So we see that in a way, right? The Friedrich Rebbe was alluding to himself as well, right? That the Friedrich Rebbe also was doing the same thing. He was living in a deep, well, some of the, you know, the deepest years of Gaulus, right? Some of the deepest years of Gaulus during the times of the Holocaust and the time of the book of the, of the, of the, the communists and the times of, you know, all this crazy stuff, right? And he was sitting there pushing and pushing and pushing, saying, we, no matter what, we need to live like Jews. Because when we're in Galus, only our body is in Galus, but not our soul. Okay? So I guess we'll stop here for today. And we can continue with Hashem next, next week, okay? Do you guys have any questions? Okay, I'll take that as a no. So I'll see you guys next week, God willing, okay? Bye, guys. Shalom, shalom, bye-bye. Bye, see you next week.